Chapter Six of the Secret Passage by Fergus Hume. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read for you today by Don Larson in Minnesota. The Secret Passage by Fergus Hume, Chapter Six: A Perplexing Case. The morning after his visit to Lord Caranby. Mallow was unexpectedly called to Devonshire on account of his mother's illness. Mrs. Mallow was a fretful hypochondriac, and always imagined herself worse than she really was. Cuthbert had often been summoned to her dying bed, only to find that she was alive and well. He expected that this summons would be another false alarm, but, being a dutiful son, he tore himself away from town and took the midday express to Exeter. As he expected, Mrs. Mallow was by no means so bad as she hinted in her wire, and Cuthbert was vexed that she should have called him down, but she insisted that he should remain, and, unwilling to cause her pain, he did so. It was four days before he returned to London, but his visit to Exeter was not without results, for he asked his mother about Caranby's romance. Mrs. Mallow knew all about it and highly disapproved of her brother-in-law. He's crazy, she said vigorously, when the subject was brought up one evening. All his life he has been queer. Your father should have had the title, Cuthbert. Well, I shall have it some day, said her son soothingly. Caranby is not likely to marry. Yes, but I'll never be Lady Caranby, lamented Mrs. Mallow who was intensely selfish and egotistical. And I should have adorned the title, such an old one as it is, too. But I'm glad that horrid Selina Loach never became his wife. Even that Saul girl would have been better. Don't speak evil of the dead, mother. I don't see why we should praise the bad dead, snapped Mrs. Mallow. I never liked either Isabella nor Selina. They were both horrid girls and constantly quarrelling. They hardly ever spoke to one another, and how you can contemplate marrying the daughter of Isabella, I really don't know. Such a slight to me. But there I've said all I have to say on the subject. To do her justice, Mrs. Mallow certainly had, and never ceased nagging at Cuthbert to break the engagement. Had she known that Mrs. Octagon had forbidden the marriage, she would have rejoiced, but to save making awkward explanations to a woman who would not hold her tongue, Cuthbert said nothing about the breach. Did you like Miss Saul, mother? he asked. I only saw her on the concert platform, said Mrs. Mallow, opening her eyes. Gracious, Cuthbert, I never associated myself with those sort of people. Caranby was infatuated with her. To be sure, he got engaged to spite Selina and she really did treat him badly. But I believe Miss Saul, such a horrid Hebrew name, isn't it, hypnotized him. He forgot her almost as soon as she died, in spite of his ridiculous idea of shutting up that house. And such valuable land as there is at Rexton, too. Well, I hope this violent death of Selina will be a warning to Caranby. Not that I wish him any harm, in spite of your being next heir to the title and we do need money. While Mrs. Mallow rambled on in this diffusive manner, Cuthbert was thinking. When she ended, why should this death be a warning to Caranby? he asked quickly. Good gracious, Cuthbert, don't get on my nerves. Why? Because I believe that Selina pushed Miss Saul off that plank and killed her. She was just the kind of violent girl who would do a thing like that and Miss Saul's relatives have waited all these years to kill Selina, and now she's dead, and they will kill Caranby because he did not marry the wretched girl. Cuthbert stared. Mother, what are you talking about? Caranby told me that Miss Saul only had one brother, and that probably he was dead. Ah, said Mrs. Mallow. He didn't tell you that Miss Saul's father was arrested for coining, or passing false money. I forget which. I believe the brother was also involved, but I can't be sure. But I only know the girl was dead then, 
and the Saul family did not move in the matter, as the police knew too much about them. Good gracious, shuddered the lady. To think, if she had lived, Caranby would have married into that family and have cheated you of the title. Are you sure of what you say, mother? Of course I am. Look at any old file of newspapers and you'll read all about the matter. It's old history now. But I really won't talk any more of these things, Cuthbert. If I do, there will be no sleep for me tonight. Oh, dear me, such nerves as I have. Did you ever see Miss Saul, mother? I told you I did on the platform. She was a fine, large, big girl with a hook nose and big black eyes. Rather like Selina and Isabella, for I'm sure they have Jewish blood in their veins. Miss Saul, if that was her real name, might have passed as a relative of those horrid Loach girls. Mrs. Octagon and her sister who died are certainly much alike. Of course they are, and if Miss Saul had lived, they would have been a kind of triplets. I hate that style of beauty myself, said Mrs. Mallow, who was slim and fair. So coarse. Everyone called those loach girls pretty, but I never did myself. I never liked them, and I won't call on Mrs. Octagon. Such a vulgar name. If you marry fifty of her wretched daughters, Cuthbert. Don't say that, mother. Juliet is an angel. Then she can't be her mother's daughter, said Mrs. Mallow obscurely and finished the discussion in what she considered to be a triumphant manner. Nor would she renew it, though her son tried to learn more about the Loach and the Saul families. However, he was satisfied with the knowledge he had acquired. While returning next day to London, he had ample time to think over what he had been told. Miss Selina Loach had certainly shut herself up for many years in Rose Cottage, and it seemed as though she was afraid of being hurt in some way. Perhaps she even anticipated a violent death. And then Mrs. Octagon hinted that she knew who had killed her sister. It might not have been Caranby after all whom she meant, but one of the Saul family, as Mrs. Mallow suggested. I wonder if it is as my mother thinks, mused Cuthbert, staring out of the window, at the panorama of the landscape moving swiftly past. Perhaps Selina did kill Miss Saul, and shut herself up to avoid being murdered by one of the relatives. Caranby said that Selina did not go to the inquest, but pretended she was ill. Then she and her sister went to the continent for two years, and finally when they returned, Selina, instead of taking her proper place in society as Isabella did, shut herself up as a recluse in Rose Cottage. The Saul family appear to have been a bad lot. I should like to look up that coining case. I wonder if I dare tell Jennings. He was doubtful of the wisdom of doing this. If he told what he knew and set Jennings on the track, it might be that a scandal would arise implicating Mrs. Octagon. Not that Cuthbert cared much for her, but she was Juliet's mother, and he wanted to avert any trouble likely to cause the girl pain. A dozen times on the journey, Cuthbert altered his mind. First he thought he would tell Jennings, then he decided to hold his peace. This indecision was not like him, but the case was so perplexing and such serious issues were involved that the young man felt thoroughly worried. Hitherto he had seen nothing new about the case in the papers, but on reaching Swindon he bought a few and looked through them. His search was rewarded by finding an article on the crime. The inquest had been held, and the jury had brought in a verdict of murder against some person or persons unknown. But it was plainly stated that the police could not find a clue to the assassin. The article in question did not pretend to solve the mystery, but collocated the facts so as to put the case in a nutshell. The facts are these, said the journal after a preliminary introduction. A quiet maiden lady living at Rose Cottage, Rexton, received three friends to a card party. Difference arising, and such things will arise, amongst the best when cards are in question. 
Two of the friends, Mrs. Hearn, an old lady and lifelong friend of the deceased, and Mr. Hale, a lawyer of repute and the legal adviser of Miss Loach, departed before ten o'clock. In her evidence, Mrs. Hearn stated that she and Mr. Hale left at half-past nine, and her assertion was corroborated by Mr. Hale himself. Mr. Clancy, the third friend, left at ten, being shown out by the maid, Susan Grant, who then returned to the kitchen. She left Miss Loach seated in her usual chair near the fire, and with a pack of cards on her lap. Probably the deceased lady intended to play a game of patience. The four servants, three women and a man, had their supper. During the supper the man asserted that he heard the front door, but as Miss Loach was in the habit of walking in the garden before retiring, it was thought that she had gone out to take her usual stroll. Whether the man heard the door open or shut he was not quite sure. However, thinking his mistress was walking in the garden as usual, the man paid no further attention to the incident. At eleven, precisely at eleven, for the kitchen clock struck, the sitting-room bell rang. Susan Grant entered the room and found Miss Loach seated in her chair exactly as she had left her, even to the fact that the cards were in her lap. But she had been stabbed to the heart with some sharp instrument and was quite dead. The front door was closed and the windows barred. Now it is certain that Miss Loach met her death between the hours of ten and eleven. Susan Grant saw her alive at ten, seated in her usual chair, with the cards on her lap, and at eleven she there found her dead, still with the cards. It would seem as though immediately after the servants left the room someone had stabbed the deceased to the heart before she had time to rise or even alter her position. But Susan Grant asserts that no one was in the room. There was only one door out of which she departed. The bedroom of Miss Loach on the basement floor had a door which opened into the passage, as did the sitting-room door. No one could have entered until the servant departed. The passage was lighted with electricity, but she did not observe anyone about nor did she hear a sound. She showed out Mr. Clancy and then returned to the kitchen. Certainly the assassin may have been concealed in the bedroom and have stolen into the sitting-room when Susan Grant was showing out Mr. Clancy. Perhaps then he killed the deceased suddenly, as we said before. He could have then come up the stairs and have escaped while the servants were at supper. It might have been the murderer who opened the door and was overheard by Thomas. The policeman was on duty about ten, as he was seen by Susan Grant when she showed Mr. Clancy to the door. The policeman also asserted that he was again on the spot, i.e. in the roadway opposite the cottage, at eleven. At these times the assassin could not have escaped without being seen. There is no exit at the back as a high wall running around an unfinished house belonging to the eccentric Lord Caranby blocks the way. Therefore the assassin must have ventured into the roadway. He could then have walked up the lane into the main streets of Rexton, or have taken a path opposite to the gate of Rose Cottage, which leads to the railway station. Probably, after executing the crime, he took this latter way. The path runs between quick-set hedges, rather high for a long distance, past houses, and ends within fifty feet of the railway station. The criminal could take the first train and get to town, there to lose himself in the wilderness of London. So far, so good. But the strangest thing about this most mysterious affair is that the bell in the sitting-room rang two minutes before Susan Grant entered the room, to find her mistress dead. This was some time after the closing of the door overheard by Thomas. Therefore the assassin could not have escaped that way. Moreover, by this time the policeman was standing blocking the pathway to the station. Again, the alarm was given immediately by other servants who rushed to the sitting-room on hearing Susan scream, 
and the policeman at once searched the house. No one was found. Now what are we to make of all this? The doctor declares that Miss Loach, when discovered, had been dead half an hour, which corresponds with the time the door was heard to open, or shut, by Thomas. So far it would seem that the assassin had escaped then, having committed the crime, and found the coast inside and outside the house clear for his flight. But who rang the bell? That is the question we ask. The deceased could not have done so, as according to the doctor, the poor lady must have died immediately. Again, the assassin would not have been so foolish as to ring and thus draw attention to his crime, letting alone the question that he could not have escaped at that late hour. We can only offer this solution. The assassin must have been concealed in the bedroom, and after Susan ascended the stairs to let Mr. Clancy out, he must have stolen into the sitting-room and have killed the old lady before she could even rise. She might have touched the bell, and the button, the bell is an electric one, may have got fixed. Later on the heat of the room warping the wood around the ivory button may have caused it to slip out, and thus the bell would have rung. Of course, our readers may say that when pressed down the bell would have rung continuously, but an examination has revealed that the wires were out of order. It is not improbable that the sudden release of the button may have touched the wires and have set them ringing. The peal is described as being short and sharp. This theory is a weak one, we are aware, but the whole case is so mysterious that weak as it is, we can offer no other solution. Mrs. Hearn, the servants, and Misters Hale and Clancy were examined. All insist that Miss Loach was in her usual health and spirits, and had no idea of committing suicide, or of being in any danger of sudden death. The weapon cannot be discovered, nor the means, save as we suggest above, whereby the assassin can have made his escape. The whole affair is one of the most mysterious of late years, and will doubtless be relegated to the list of undiscovered crimes. The police have no clue, and apparently despair of finding one. But the discovery of the mystery lies in the bell. Who rang it? or did it ring of itself, as we suggested above? Cuthbert laid down the paper with a shrug. The article did not commend itself to him, save as the means of making a presses of the case. The theory of the bell appeared excessively weak, and he could not understand a man being so foolish as to put it forward. If the button was pressed down by Miss Loach, the bell would have rung at once, argued Cuthbert and when it slipped up, even with the heat, the ringing would have stopped. But the bell rang at eleven, and the girl was in the room two minutes later. Someone must have rung it. But why did someone do this, and how did someone escape after ringing, in so foolhardy a manner? He could not find an answer to this question. The whole case was indeed most perplexing. There seemed absolutely no answer to the riddle. Even supposing Miss Loach had been murdered, out of a long-delayed revenge by a member of the Saul family, and that theory appeared ridiculous to Mallow, the question was how did the assassin escape? Certainly having regard to the card still being on the lap of the deceased, and the closing of the door at a time when the policeman was not in the vicinity, the assassin may have escaped in that way. But how did he come to be hidden in the bedroom, and how did he kill the old lady before she had time to call out, or even to rise, seeing that he had the whole length of the room to cross before reaching her? And again, the escape of the assassin at this hour did not explain the ringing of the bell. Cuthbert was deeply interested, and wondered if the mystery would ever be solved. I must see Jennings after all, he thought as the train steamed into Paddington. And see Jennings he did, sooner than he expected. That same evening, when he was dressed to go out, a card was brought. It was inscribed, Miles Jennings. 
Rather surprised that the detective should seek him out so promptly, Cuthbert entered his sitting-room. Jennings, who was standing with his back to the window, saluted him with a pleasant smile, and spoke to him as to an equal. Of course he had every right to do so, since he had been at school with Mallow, but somehow the familiarity irritated Cuthbert. Well, Jennings, what is it? I came to ask you a few questions, Mallow. About what? About the murder at Rose Cottage. But, my dear fellow, I know nothing about it. You knew Miss Loach? Yes, I saw her once or twice, but I did not like her. She is the aunt of the young lady you are engaged to marry. Mallow drew himself up stiffly. As a matter of fact, she is, he said, with marked coldness. But I don't see... You will in a minute, said Jennings briskly. Pardon me, but are you in love with another woman? Mallow grew red. What the devil do you mean by coming here to ask me such a question? he demanded. Gently, Mallow. I am your friend, and you may need one. What do you mean? Do you accuse me of... I accuse you of nothing, said Jennings quickly. But I ask you, why did you give this photograph, with an inscription, to the servant of the murdered woman? I recognize my photograph, but the servant? Susan Grant, the picture was found in her possession. She refuses to speak. Here the detective spoke lower. In case you get in trouble with the police. End of chapter 6「Chapter Seven of the Secret Passage by Fergus Hume. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read for you today by Don Larson in Minnesota. The Secret Passage by Fergus Hume, Chapter Seven. The Detective. The two men looked at one another, Jennings searchingly and Cuthbert with a look of mingled amazement and indignation. They were rather alike in looks, both being tall, slim, and fair-haired, but Mallow wore a moustache, whereas the detective, possibly for the sake of disguising himself on occasions, was thoroughly clean-shaven. But although Jennings' profession was scarcely that of a gentleman, he looked well-bred, and was dressed in the same quiet taste and refinement as characterized Mallow. The public school stamp was on both, and they might have been a couple of young men about town discussing sport, rather than an officer of the law, and a man who it seemed from Jennings' hints was suspected of complicity in a crime. "'Do you mean this for a jest?' said Cuthbert at length. "'I never jest on matters connected with my profession, Mallow. It is too serious a one.' "'Naturally. It so often involves the issues of life and death.' "'In this case I hope it does not,' said Jennings significantly. Cuthbert, who was recovering his composure, sat down with a shrug. "'I assure you, you have found a mare's nest this time. "'Whatever my follies may have been, I am not a criminal.' "'I never thought you were,' rejoined the other, also taking a seat. "'But you may have become involved with people who are criminals.' "'I dare say half of those one meets in society are worthy of jail.' "'Did one know what is done under the rose?' returned Cuthbert. "'By the way, how did you come so opportunely?' "'I knew you had gone out of town, as I came a few days ago, to see you about this matter, and inquired. Your servant said you were in Devonshire.' "'I went to see my mother, who was ill,' said Mallow quickly. "'I guessed as much. You said something about your mother living in Exeter when we met last.' Well, I had Paddington watch for your return, and my messenger. Your spy, you mean, said Mallow angrily. Certainly, if you prefer the term. Well, your spy, I mean my spy, reported that you were back, so I came on here. Are you going out? I was, but if you wish to arrest me. Nonsense, man. I have only come to have a quiet chat with you. Believe me, I wish you well. I have not forgotten the old Eton days. I tell you what, Jennings, I won't stand this talk from any man. Are you here as a gentleman or as a detective? As both, I hope, replied the other dryly. 
but are we not wasting valuable time? If you wish to go out this evening, the sooner we get to business, the better. Will you answer my questions? I must know what they are first, said Cuthbert defiantly. Jennings looked irritated. If you won't treat me properly, I may as well leave the matter alone, he said coolly. My position is quite unpleasant enough as it is. I came here to an old schoolfellow as a friend. To try and implicate him in a crime. Thanks for nothing. Jennings, whose patience appeared to be exhausted, rose. Very well, then, Mallow. I shall go away and hand over the matter to someone else. I assure you the questions must be answered. Cuthbert made a sign to the other to be seated, which Jennings seemed by no means inclined to obey. He stood stiffly by his chair as Mallow paced the room reflectively. "'After all, I don't see why we should quarrel,' said the latter at length. "'That's just what I've been driving at for the last ten minutes.' "'Very good,' said Mallow soothingly. "'Let us sit down and smoke. I have no particular engagement, and if you will have some coffee—' "'I will have both cigarette and coffee if you will help me unravel this case.' said Jennings, sitting down with a smoother brow. "'But I don't see what I can—' "'You'll see shortly. Will you be open with me?' "'That requires reflection. Reflect as long as you like. But if you decline, I will hand over the case to the next man on the Scotland Yard list. He may not deal with you so gently.' "'I don't care how he deals with me,' returned Mallow haughtily. "'Having done no wrong—' I am not afraid. And what is more, Jennings, I was coming to see you as soon as I returned. You have only forestalled our interview. What did you wish to see me about? This case, said Cuthbert, getting out a box of cigarettes and touching the bell. The deuce, said Jennings brusquely. Then you know something? Cuthbert handed him the box and gave an order for coffee. Any liqueur? he asked in friendly tones. "'No, I never drink when on, er, pleasure,' said the other, substituting a word, since the servant was in the room. "'Well,' he asked when the door closed, "'why did you wish to see me?' "'To ask if you remember a coining case that took place some twenty years ago.' "'No, that was before my time. What case is it?' "'Some people called Saul were mixed up in it.' "'Hm, never heard of them,' said Jennings, lighting a cigarette." "'But it is strange you should talk of coining. "'I and several other fellows are looking for a set of coiners now. "'There are a lot of false coins circulating, "'and they are marvellously made. "'If I can only lay my hands on the coiners and their factory, "'there will be a sensation. "'And your reputation will be enhanced.' "'I hope so,' replied the detective, reddening. "'I want to rise in my salary, and I wish to marry. "'By the way,' "'How is Miss Saxon?' "'Very well. You met her, did you not?' "'Yes, you took me to that queer house. "'What do they call it? The Shrine of the Muses, "'where all the sham art exists. "'Why do you look so grave, old boy?' "'The two men, getting more confidential, "'were dropping into the language of school days "'and speaking more familiarly. "'Mallow did not reply at once, "'as his servant had just brought in the coffee.' but when each gentleman was supplied with a cup and they were again alone, he looked gravely at Miles. "'I want to ask your advice,' he said, "'and if you are my friend.' "'I am. Of course I am.' "'Well, then, I am as interested in finding out who killed Miss Loach as you are.' "'Why is that?' demanded Jennings, puzzled. "'Before I answer and make a clean breast of it, I should like you to promise that you will get no one I know into trouble. Jennings hesitated. That is a difficult matter. Of course, if I find the assassin, even if he or she is one of your friends, I must do my duty. Oh, I don't expect anything of that sort, said Mallow easily. But why do you say he or she? Well, the person who killed Miss Loach might be a woman. "'I don't see how you make that out,' said Cuthbert reflectively. "'I read the case coming in on the train today, "'and it seems to me, from what the planet says, "'that the whole thing is a mystery.' "'One which I mean to dive into and discover,' replied Miles. "'I do not care for an ordinary murder case, 
but this is one after my own heart. It is a criminal problem, which I should like to work out. Do you see your way as yet? asked Cuthbert. No, confessed Jennings, I do not. I saw the report you speak of. The writer theorizes without having facts to go on. What he says about the bell is absurd. All the same, the bell did ring, and the assassin could not have escaped at the time it sounded, nor could the deceased have rung it. Therein lies the mystery, and I can't guess how the business was managed. Do you believe the assassin rang the bell? Miles shrugged his shoulders and sipped his coffee. It is impossible to say. I will wait until I have more facts before me, before I venture an opinion. It is only in detective novels that the heaven-born Vidocq can guess the truth on a few stray clues. But what were you going to tell me? Will you keep what I say to yourself? Yes, said Jennings readily enough, so long as it doesn't mean the escape of a person who is guilty. I don't ask you to betray the confidence placed in you by the authorities to that extent, said Mallow. Just wait a moment. He leaned his chin on his hand and thought, if he wished to gain the hand of Juliet, it was necessary he should clear up the mystery of the death. Unaided, he could not do so, but with the assistance of his old schoolfellow, following his lead, in fact, he might get at the truth. Then, when the name of the assassin of her sister was known, the reason of Mrs. Octagon's strange behavior might be learned, and, moreover, the discovery might remove her objection. On the other hand, Cuthbert could not help feeling uneasy, lest Mrs. Octagon have some secret connection with the death, which made her refuse her consent to the match, and which, if he explained to Jennings what he knew, might become known in a quarter which she might not approve of. However, Mallow was certain that, in spite of Mrs. Octagon's hint, his uncle had nothing to do with the matter, and he had already warned her, although she refused to listen, that he intended to trace the assassin. Under these circumstances, and also because Jennings was a friend, and more likely to aid him than get anyone he knew and respected into trouble, the young man made up his mind to tell everything. The fact is, I am engaged to Juliet Saxon, he began hesitatingly. I know that. She is the daughter of that absurd Mrs. Octagon, with the meek husband and the fine opinion of herself. Yes, but Juliet is the niece of Miss Loach. What? Jennings sprang from his chair with a look of surprise. Do you mean to tell me that Mrs. Octagon is Miss Loach's sister? I do. They quarreled many years ago and have not been friendly for years. Mrs. Octagon would never go and see her sister, but she did not forbid her children from being friendly. As you may guess, Mrs. Octagon is much distressed about the murder, but the strange thing is that she declares this death renders it impossible for me to marry her daughter. Jennings looks searchingly at his friend. That is strange. Does she give a reason? No, but knowing my uncle knew her when she was a girl, I thought I would ask him what he thought. He told me that he had once been engaged to Miss Loach, and... "'Well, go on,' said Miles, seeing Cuthbert hesitating. "'There was another lady in the case.' <laughs> "'There usually is,' Jennings said dryly. "'Well?' "'The other lady's name is Saul, Emilia Saul.' "'Oh,' Miles sat down again. "'He had remained standing for a few moments. "'Saul was the name you mentioned in connection with the coining case of twenty years ago.' "'Cuthbert nodded.' and now, being fully convinced that he badly needed Jennings' aid, he told all that he had heard from Caranby, and detailed what his mother had said. Also, he touched on the speech of Mrs. Octagon, and repeated the warning he had given her. Miles listened quietly, but made no remark till his friend had finished. "'You have told me all you know?' he asked. "'Yes, I want you to help me.' Not that I think what I have learned has anything to do with this case. I'm not so sure of that, said Jennings musingly, his eyes on the carpet. Mrs. Octagon bases her refusal to allow the marriage on the fact of the death. 
However, you have warned her, and she must take the consequence. But, my dear Jennings, you don't think she has anything to do with the matter. I assure you she is a good, kind woman. With a violent temper, according to your mother, finished Jennings dryly. However, don't alarm yourself. I don't think she is guilty. I should think not, cried Mallow indignantly. Juliet's mother? But she may have something to do with the matter all the same. However, you have been plain with me, and I will do all I can to help you. The first thing is for us to follow up the clue of the portrait. Ah, yes, I had quite forgotten that, said Mallow, casting a look on the photograph which lay near at hand. Just pass it, will you? Miles did so. You say you recognize it, he said. I recognize my own face. I had several portraits done like this. I think this one... Mallow looked at the inscription, which he read, for the first time, and his face grew pale. "'What is it?' asked Miles eagerly. "'I don't know,' faltered the other one uneasily. "'You recognize the inscription?' "'Yes, I certainly wrote that.' "'It is quite a tender inscription,' said Miles, his eyes on the disturbed face of the other. "'With my dear love,' it reads. Cuthbert laid down the portrait and nodded. "'Yes, that is the inscription,' he said in low tones, and his eyes sought the carpet. "'You wrote that to a servant?' "'What servant?' "'The new parlour-maid engaged by Miss Loach on the day of her death, Susan Grant. "'I remember the name. I saw it in the papers.' "'Do you know the girl well?' asked Jennings. "'I don't know her at all.' "'Come now. A man doesn't give a portrait with such an inscription to any unknown girl.' nor to one he is not in love with. "'Jennings!' cried Mallow indignantly. "'How can you think?' His voice died away, and he clenched his hands. "'What am I to think, then?' demanded the detective. "'What you like.' "'That you love this Susan Grant?' "'I tell you I never set eyes on her,' said Cuthbert violently. "'Then how does she come into possession of your portrait?' asked the other. Then, seeing that Mallow refused to speak, he laid a persuasive hand on his shoulder. "'You must speak out,' he said quickly. "'You have told me so much you must tell all. "'Matters can't stand as they are.' "'No,' here Jennings looked straight into Mallow's eyes. "'You did not give that portrait to Susan Grant.' "'I never said so.' "'Don't be an ass, Mallow. "'You say you don't know the girl, "'therefore you can hardly have given her the photograph.' Now the inscription shows that it was given to a woman you are in love with. You told me when you introduced me to Miss Saxon that she was the only woman you ever loved. Therefore you gave this portrait with its tender inscription to her. I, I can't say. You mean you won't trust me, said Jennings. Cuthbert rose quickly and flung off his friend's arm. I wish to heaven I had never opened my mouth to you, he said. "'My dear fellow, you should show more confidence in me. "'I know quite well what you won't acknowledge, "'that you gave this photograph to Miss Saxon. "'You think it will implicate her in the matter.' "'Jennings!' cried Cuthbert, his face growing red and fierce. "'Wait a moment,' resumed the other, calmly and without flinching. "'I can explain. "'You gave the photograph to Miss Saxon.' She gave it to Miss Loach, and Susan Grant, falling in love with your face, took possession of it. It was found in her trunk. "'Yes, yes, that's it,' cried Mallow, catching at the straw. "'I did give the photograph to Juliet, and no doubt she gave it to her aunt. It would be easy for this girl to take it.' "'Though why she should steal it,' said Cuthbert, perplexed, "'I really can't say.' "'You don't know her?' asked Jennings. "'No, really I don't. "'The name is quite unknown to me. "'What is the girl like in appearance?' "'Jennings described Susan to the best of his ability, "'but Cuthbert shook his head. "'No, I never saw her. "'You say she had this photograph in her trunk?' "'Then on receiving an affirmative reply, "'she may have found it lying about and have taken it, "'though why she should, I can't say.' "'So you said before,' said Jennings dryly, 
"'But strange as it may appear, Mallow, this girl is in love with you.' "'How do you know that?' "'Well, you see,' said Miles slowly, "'after the murder I searched the boxes of the servants in the house for the weapon. "'But there was no danger of them being accused. "'No, nor would I have searched the boxes if they had not insisted, "'but they were all so afraid of being accused "'that they wished to exonerate themselves as much as possible. "'The fact is that the whole four were in the kitchen together "'at the time of the crime being committed, and clears them.' However, they insisted, so I looked into their boxes. I found the photograph in the box of the new housemaid. She refuses to state how it came into her possession, and became so red and wept so much that I soon saw that she loved you. But I tell you, it's ridiculous. I don't know the girl, and a servant, too. Pshaw! Well, then, I must get her to see you, and possibly some explanation may be made. I took possession of the photograph. Why? On what grounds should my photograph interest you, Jennings? On the grounds that you are a friend of mine, and that I knew your face the moment I saw it. I naturally asked the girl how it came into her possession, and I know your tastes don't lie in the way of pretty parlor-maids, however attractive. It was her reply which made me take the portrait and come to ask you for an explanation. "'What reply did she make?' demanded Cuthbert, exasperated by the false position in which he was placed. "'She said that she would explain nothing in case you should get in trouble with the police. Can you explain that?' "'No,' said Mallow, perplexed. "'I really cannot be responsible for the vagaries of a parlour-maid. "'I don't know the name Susan Grant, and from your description of her appearance I never set eyes on her.' I am quite sure your explanation is the correct one. Juliet gave it to her aunt, and for some ridiculous reason this girl stole it. But her remark about the police. Mallow made a gesture of helplessness, and leaned his elbow on the mantelpiece. I can't guess what she means. Well, what will you do now, Jennings? First, I shall get the girl to come here and see you. Then I shall ask Miss Saxon why she gave the photograph to Miss Loach. You were not a favorite with the old lady, I gather. On the contrary, she liked me much more than I did her. You see, she liked you so much that she insisted on having your photograph. I must ask Miss Saxon when she gave it. Will you let me bring the girl to see you tomorrow? Certainly, but it's all very unpleasant. The detective rose to go. Most matters connected with a crime are, my dear fellow, he said calmly. I only hope there will not be any more unpleasantness. What do you mean? I can't say what I mean yet. You are mysterious, Jennings. I am perplexed. I don't seem to advance. However, I intend to follow up the clue of your photograph, though, if the explanation I suggested is a true one, there's nothing more to be said. But the girl, Susan Grant, has not the look of a thief. That means I gave her the photograph, said Cuthbert haughtily. Not necessarily, rejoined Jennings, putting on his overcoat. But I will not theorize any more. Wait till I confront the girl with you in a few days. Then we may force her to speak. Cuthbert shrugged his shoulders. As you please but I really am at a loss to think what she will say. So am I, said Jennings, as they walked to the door. That is why I am anxious to see her and you together. And, after all, I may have found only a mare's nest. You certainly have so far as I am concerned. By the way, when is the body to be buried? The day after tomorrow, then the will has to be read. I hope the old lady will leave you some money, Mallow. She was reported to be rich. Oh, by the way, I'll look up the Saul coining case you speak of. Why? asked Mello bluntly and uneasily. It may have some bearing on this matter. Only in the past will we find the truth. And Miss Selina Loach certainly knew Miss Saul. As Jennings departed, the postman came up the stairs with the late letters. Cuthbert found one from Juliet and opened it at once. It contained one line. Don't see the police about aunt's death. 
Juliet. Cuthbert Mallow slept very badly that night. End of chapter 7「Passage. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Secret Passage by Fergus Hume. Chapter 8. The Course of True Love. The most obvious thing for Cuthbert to do was to seek Juliet and ask for an explanation of her mysterious note. He went to the Shrine of the Muses the very next day, but was informed that Miss Saxon and her mother had gone out of town and would not be back for a few days. He could not learn where they were, and was leaving the house somewhat disconsolately when he met Basil. "'You here, Mallow,' said that young gentleman, stopping short. "'Have you been to see my mother?' "'I went to see Juliet,' replied Cuthbert, not sorry that the meeting had taken place, "'but I hear she is out of town.' "'Well, not exactly. The fact is, she and my mother have gone down to Rose Cottage, and intend to stop there until the funeral is over and the will is read.' "'The will?' echoed Mallow. "'Yes. Aunt Selina is likely to leave a great deal of money. I expect we will all go to Juliet. She never liked me.' "'Yet you were frequently at her house.' "'I was,' confessed Basil candidly. "'I tried to make myself as civil as possible, so that she might remember me. Between ourselves, Mallow, I am deuced hard up. My mother hasn't much money, I have none of my own, and old Octocon is as stingy as he well can be.' This sounded well, coming from an idler who never did a stroke of work, and who lived on the charity of his stepfather. But Basil had peculiar views as to money. He considered himself a genius, and that Peter should be proud to support him until, as he phrased it, he had stamped his name on the age. But the stamping took a long time, and Basil troubled himself very little about the matter. He remarked that genius should not be forced, and loafed away the greater portion of his days. His mother kept him pocket-money and clothes. Peter supplied board and lodging and Basil got through life very pleasantly. He wished to be famous, to have his name in every mouth and his portrait in every paper. But the work that was necessary to obtain these desirable things he was unwilling to do. Cuthbert knew that the young fellow had been born tired, and although something of an idler himself, like Basil none the more for his laziness. Had Mallow been poor, he would certainly have earned his bread. But he had a good income and did not work, and, after all, he only pursued the way of life in which he had been brought up. But Basil was poor, and had his career to make, therefore he certainly should have laboured. However, for Juliet's sake, Cuthbert was as polite as possible. "'If I were you, Saxon, I should leave the cards alone,' said Mallow. "'Nonsense! I don't play high. Besides, I have seen you at Maraquito's also losing a lot.' "'I can afford to lose,' said Cuthbert dryly. "'You can't.' "'No, by Jove, you're right there. But don't preach, Mallow. You ain't such a saint yourself.' "'Can I help you with a cheque? "'Basil had good breeding enough to colour. "'No, I didn't explain myself for that,' he said coldly. "'And besides, if Juliet comes in for Aunt Selina's money, I'll get some. "'Juliet and I always share.' "'This meant that Juliet was to give the money, and Basil to spend it. "'Mallow was disgusted with his candid selfishness. "'However, he did not wish to quarrel with Basil, "'as he knew Juliet was fond of him. "'And moreover, in the present state of affairs, he was anxious to have another friend beside Mr. Octagon in the house. "'Perhaps Miss Loach may have left you some money after all,' he remarked. "'By Jove, I hope so. I'll be in a hole if she has not. There's a bill.' Here he stopped, as though conscious of having said too much. "'But that will come into Juliet's possession,' he murmured. "'What's that?' asked Cuthbert sharply. "'Nothing, nothing. Only a tailor's bill. "'As to getting money by the will,' "'Don't you know I quarrelled with Aunt Selina a week before her death? "'Yes, she turned me out of the house.' "'Here Basil's face assumed what may be described as an ugly look. "'I should like to have got even with the old cat. "'She insulted me.' "'Gently, old fellow,' said Mallow, "'seeing that Basil was losing his temper, "'and having occasionally seen, and having occasionally seen him in fits of uncontrollable passion. "'We're in the public street.' "'Basil's bow cleared. "'All right,' he said. "'Don't bother.' "'I'll be all right when Juliet gets the money. "'By the way, Mother says you're not going to marry her.' "'Your mother is mistaken,' rejoined Mallow gravely. "'Juliet and I are still engaged. "'I do not intend to give her up.' "'I told Mother you would not give in so easily,' said Basil, frowning. "'But you can't marry Juliet.' 
"'Why not?' asked Cuthbert sharply. "'Do you know the reason?' Basil appeared about to say something, then suddenly closed his mouth and shook his head. Cuthbert pressed him. "'If you know the reason, tell me,' he said, "'and I'll help you out of your difficulties. "'You know I love Juliet, and your mother does not seem to have any excuse to forbid the marriage.' "'I would help you if I could, but I can't. "'You had better ask Juliet herself. "'She may tell you the reason. "'How can I find her? "'Go down to Rose Cottage and ask to see her,' suggested Basil. "'Your mother will not admit me.' "'That's true enough. "'Well, I'll tell you what, Mallow. "'I'll speak to Juliet and get her to make an appointment to see you. "'I could write and ask her for one myself. "'Oh, no, you couldn't. "'Mother will intercept all letters.' "'Upon my word!' began Mallow angrily, then stopped. It was useless to show his wrath before this silly boy, who could do no good and might do a deal of harm. "'Very well, then,' he said more mildly. "'Ask Juliet to meet me on the other side of the Vexton, under the wall which runs around the unfinished house.' Basil started. "'Why that place?' he asked nervously. "'It's as good as any other.' "'You can't get inside. That's true enough. But we can meet outside. I have been inside, though, and I made a mess of myself climbing the wall.' "'You were inside,' began Basil, then suddenly appeared relieved. "'I remember you were there on the day after Aunt Selina was killed.' "'I have been there before that,' said Cuthbert, wondering why the young man avoided his eye in so nervous a manner. "'Not at—at at night,' murmured Saxon, looking away. "'Once I was there at night. Why do you ask?' "'Oh, nothing, nothing. I was just thinking it's a wild place in which to find oneself at night. By the way—' added Basil, as though anxious to change a disagreeable subject. "'Do you think Jarvie Hale a nice fellow?' "'No, I don't. I have met him at Maraquito's, and I don't like him. He's a bounder. Moreover, a respectable lawyer has no right to gamble to the extent he does. I wonder Miss Loach trusted him.' "'Perhaps she didn't know of his gambling,' said Basil, his eyes wandering everywhere but to the face of his companion. "'But should you think Hale would be hard on a fellow?' "'Yes, I should.' Do you owe him money? A few pounds. He won't give me time to pay. And I say, Mallow, I suppose all Aunt Selina's affairs will be left in Hale's hands. I can't say. It depends on the will. If everything is left to Juliet unconditionally, she may take her affairs out of Hale's hands. I should certainly advise her to do so. He's too intimate with Maraquito and her gambling salon to be a decent lawyer. You do seem down on gambling, said Basil. "'Yet you gamble yourself a lot. "'But I expect Juliet will change her lawyer. "'I hope she will.' "'Why?' asked Cuthbert sharply. "'Oh,' replied Basil, confused. "'Because I agree with you. "'A gambler will not make a good lawyer, "'or a good husband either,' he added in an abrupt tone. "'Good day. "'I'll tell Juliet.' "'And he was off before Mallow could find words "'to answer his last remark. "'Cuthbert, walking back to his rooms, "'wondered if it was on account of the gambling "'that Mrs. Octagon objected to the marriage. "'He really did not gamble much, "'but occasionally he dropped into Maraquito's house, "'and there won or lost a few pounds. "'Here he had often met Basil, "'and without doubt the young man had told his mother, "'but he could hardly do this without incriminating himself. "'All the same, Basil was a thorough liar and a confirmed tattler. "'He might have blackened Mallow's character "'and yet told a story to exonerate himself.' His friendship appeared feigned, and Cuthbert doubted if he would really tell Juliet at the appointment. "'That young man's in trouble,' thought Mallow. "'He is anxious about Hale, and I shouldn't wonder if that respectable person has lent him a large sum of money. Probably he counts on getting the money from Juliet should she inherit the fortune of Miss Loach. Also, he seems annoyed that I should have been in Karen B.'s unfinished house at night. I wonder what he would say if he knew my reason for going there. Humph! I must keep that quiet.' The only person I dare tell is Juliet, but I can't speak to her about the matter just yet, and after all there is no need to mention my visit. It does not concern her in the least. I wonder. Here Cuthbert stopped, struck with an idea. By George, can it be the battle was near Rose Cottage on the night the crime was committed? Juliet may know that, and so, fearful lest he should be accused of the murder, asked me to stop the proceedings. Can Basil Saxon be guilty? No. Mallow shook his head and resumed his walk. He has not pluck enough to kill a fly. After this he dismissed the matter from his thoughts, and waited expectant of a letter from Juliet. None came, and he was convinced that Basil had not delivered the message. 
This being the case, Cuthbert determined to act for himself, and one afternoon went down to Rexton. That same evening he had an appointment with Jennings, who was to bring Susan Grant to Mallow's rooms, but the young man quite expected to be back in time to keep the appointment, and meantime he spent an hour wandering round Rexton, in the vicinity of Rose Cottage, but afraid lest Mrs. Octagon should see him, and keep Juliet within doors, he abstained from passing in front of the house, and waited on the path which led to the station. While watching the cottage, a young woman came along the path. She was neatly dressed and looked like a servant. Cuthbert pressed himself against the quick-set hedge to allow her to pass, as there was very little room. The girl started as she murmured her thanks, and grew crimson on seeing his face. Cuthbert, not thinking, gave a passing thought to her looks, and wondered why she had blushed. But when he saw her enter the gate of Rose Cottage, she looked back twice. He remembered the description of Jennings. "'By George,' he thought, "'that was Susan Grant. I wish I'd spoken to her. I wonder why she blushed. She can't be in love with me, as I never saw her before. All the same, it is strange about the portrait.' It was now about four o'clock, and Cuthbert fancied that, after all, it would be best to boldly ring at the door and ask admission, in spite of Mrs. Octagon. But while hesitating to risk all his chances of seeing Juliet on one throw of Fortune's dice, the matter was decided for him by the appearance of Juliet herself. She came out of the gate and walked directly towards the path. It would seem as though she expected to find Cuthbert, for she walked straight up to him and caught his hand. There was no one about to see their meeting, but Juliet was not disposed to behave tenderly. "'Why are you here?' she asked. "'Susan Grant told me—' "'Susan Grant!' echoed Cuthbert, resolved not to know too much in the presence of Juliet. "'I saw her name in the papers. How does she know of me?' "'I can't say,' said Juliet quickly. "'Come along this way.' She hurried along the narrow path, talking all the time. "'She came in just now and said you were waiting in the by-path. "'I came out at once. I don't want my mother to see you.' "'Really?' cried Cuthbert, rather nettled. "'I don't see that I have any reason to avoid Mrs. Octagon. "'She will not allow me to see you. "'If she knew I was meeting you, she would be very angry. "'We are here only till to-morrow. "'Now that Aunt Selina is buried and the will read, "'we return to Kensington at once. "'Come this way. Let us get into the open. "'I don't wish my mother to follow and find me speaking to you.' And "'They emerged into a waste piece of land, "'distant a stone-throw from the railway station, "'but secluded by reason of many trees and shrubs.' These, belonging to the old Rexton estate, had not yet been rooted up by the builder, and there ran a path through the heart of the miniature wood, leading to the station. When quite screened from observation by the friendly leafage, Juliet turned quickly. She was pale and ill in looks, and there were dark circles under her eyes, which told of sleepless nights. But she was dressed with her usual care, and behaved in a composed manner. "'I wish you had not come, Cuthbert,' she said, again taking his hand. "'At least not at present. Later on. "'I wanted to see you at once,' said Mallow determinedly. "'Did not Basil tell you?' Juliet shook her head. "'He said that he met you the other day, but he gave me no message.' "'Then he is not the friend I took him to be,' said Mallow angrily. "'Don't be angry with Basil,' said Juliet gently. "'The poor boy has quite enough trouble.' "'Of his own making,' finished Cuthbert, thoroughly annoyed. "'See here, Juliet. This sort of thing can't go on.' "'I have done nothing to warrant my being treated like this. "'Your mother is mad to behave as she is doing. "'I insist on an explanation.' "'Juliet did not pay any attention to this hasty speech. "'How do you know Basil has troubles?' she asked hurriedly. "'Because I know he's a dissipated young ass,' returned Mallow roughly, "'and I dare say you know it also.' "'Do you allude to his playing cards?' she asked quickly. "'Yes. He has no right to tell you these things. "'But I know he is in debt to Hale. He hinted as much the other day.' I would say nothing of this to you, but that I know he counts on your paying his debt. I tell you, Juliet, it is wrong for you to do so. How do you know I can? she asked. I know nothing, said Cuthbert doggedly, not even if you have inherited the money of Miss Loach. I have inherited it. She left everything to me, save legacies to Thomas, her servant, and to Emily Pell, the cook. It is a large fortune. The will was read on the day of the funeral. I have now six thousand a year. So much as that— "'How did your aunt make such a lot of money?' "'Mr. Hale speculated a great deal on her account, "'and he is very lucky, at least so he told me. "'But the money is well invested, and there are no restrictions. "'I can easily pay the few debts Basil owes, poor boy. "'You are too hard on him.' "'Perhaps I am, but he is so foolish, and he doesn't like me. 
"'I believe he puts you against me, Juliet.' "'The girl threw her arms around his neck. "'Nothing in the world would ever put me against you, Cuthbert,' she whispered vehemently. "'I love you. I love you with all my heart and soul, "'and with every fibre of my being do I love you. "'I don't care what Mother says. I love you.' "'Well, then,' said Cuthbert, between kisses, "'since you are now rich, and your own mistress, "'not that I care about the money, "'why not marry me at once?' Juliet drew back, her eyes dilated with fear. "'I dare not. I dare not,' she whispered. "'You don't know what you ask.' "'Yes, I do. Juliet, what is all this mystery about? I could not understand the meaning of your letter.' "'Did you do what I asked?' she panted. "'It was too late. I had told Jennings the detective all I knew.' "'You are not afraid?' "'Afraid!' echoed Cuthbert, opening his eyes. "'What do you mean?' She looked into his eyes. No, she said to herself, he is not afraid. Cuthbert lost his temper. I don't understand all this, he declared. If you would only speak out. But I can guess why you wish me to stop the proceedings. You fear for Basil. She stepped back a pace. For Basil? Yes. From what he hinted the other day, I believe he was about this place on the night of the— Where are your proofs? she gasped, recoiling. I have none. I am only speaking on chance. But Basil is in monetary difficulties. He is in debt to Hale. He counted on you inheriting the money of Miss Loach to pay his debts. He— Stop! Stop! cried Juliet, the blood rising to her face. This is only supposition. You can prove nothing. Then why do you wish me to hold my tongue? There is nothing for you to hold your tongue about, she answered evasively. You know nothing. Cuthbert caught her hands and looked into her troubled eyes. Do you, Juliet? Do you? Put an end to this mystery and speak out. She broke from him and fled. No, she cried, for your sake I keep silent. For your own sake, stop the action of the detective. End of chapter 8 Recording by Shirley Anderson Chapter 9 of The Secret Passage This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Shirley Anderson the Secret Passage by Fergus Hume Chapter 9 Another Mystery When Jennings arrived that evening according to appointment, he found Mallow in a state of desperation. Juliet's conduct perplexed the young man to such an extent that he felt as though on the point of losing his reason. He was quite delighted when he saw Jennings, and thus had someone with a clear head in whom to confide. "'What's the matter?' asked Jennings, who at once saw that something was wrong from Cuthbert's anxious face. "'Nothing save that I am being driven out of my senses. "'I am glad you have come, Jennings. "'Things are getting more mysterious every day. "'I am determined to get to the bottom of this murder case, "'if only for my own peace of mind. "'I am with you, heart and soul. "'I have the detective fever with a vengeance. "'You can count on my assistance in every way.' "'All right, dear chap,' said the other soothingly. "'Sit down and let us have a quiet talk before this girl arrives. "'Susan Grant, I saw her today. "'Did you speak to her?' "'No, I only guessed that she was the girl you talked about from your description, "'and from the fact that she entered Rose Cottage.' "'Ah,' said Jennings, taking a seat. "'So you have been down there?' "'Yes, I'll tell you all about it. "'I don't know if I'm sane or insane, Jennings. "'When does this girl arrive?' "'The detective glanced at his watch. "'At half-past eight. "'She'll be here in half an hour. "'Go on. What's up?' "'Read this,' said Cuthbert, "'and passed along the note from Juliet. "'I received that immediately after you went the other night.' Jennings read the note with a thoughtful look, then laid it aside and stared at his friend. "'It is strange that she should write in that way,' said he. "'I should have thought she would wish to learn who killed her aunt. What does she mean?' "'I can't tell you. I met her today, and Cuthbert gave details of his visit to Rexton, and the interview with Juliet. "'Now what does she mean?' he added in his turn, talking as though I had something to do with the matter." "'Someone's been poisoning her mind. "'That brother of hers, perhaps.' "'What do you know of him?' asked Cuthbert quickly. "'Nothing good. "'He's a hysterical idiot, "'gambles a lot and falls into rages when he loses. "'At times I don't think he's responsible for his actions.' "'Mallow threw himself back in the chair, biting his moustache. "'Every word Jennings spoke made him more confident "'that Basil had something to do with the crime. "'But why Juliet should hint at his own guilt "'Cuthbert could not imagine.' Had he been calmer, he might have hesitated to tell Jennings about Basil, but, exasperated by Juliet's half-confidence, and anxious to learn the truth, 
he gave the detective a full account of his meeting with the young man. "'What do you make of that?' he asked. "'Well,' said Jennings doubtfully, "'there's nothing much to go upon in what he said. "'He's in difficulties with Hale, certainly. "'And he seemed anxious about my having been in Caranby's grounds at night. "'Were you there? "'Yes. "'I did not intend to say anything about it, "'but I must tell you everything so that you can put things straight between me and Juliet. "'I can't understand her, "'but I am sure her mother and Basil are trying to influence her against me. "'I should not be surprised to learn that they accuse me of this murder.' "'But on what grounds?' asked Jennings quickly. "'We'll come to that presently. "'But I now see why neither Basil nor his mother want the marriage to take place. "'By the will of Miss Loach, Juliet comes in for six thousand a year, "'which is completely at her own disposal. "'Mrs. Octagon and her pet boy want to have the handling of that. "'They know if Juliet becomes my wife, I won't let them prey on her. "'So immediately Miss Loach died, the mother withdrew her consent to the marriage, "'and now she's been backed up by Basil.' "'But I thought Mrs. Octagon was well off. "'No, Saxon, her late husband, left her very little, "'and Octagon, for all his meekness, knows how to keep his money. "'Both mother and son are extravagant, "'so they hope to make poor Juliet their banker. "'In some way they have implicated me in the crime, "'and Juliet thinks that I am in danger of the gallows. "'That is why she wrote that mysterious note, Jennings. "'Today she asked me to stop proceedings for my own sake, "'which shows that she thinks me guilty.' "'I could not get a further explanation from her, as she ran away. "'Hang it!' Cuthbert jumped up angrily. "'If she'd only tell me the truth and speak straight out, "'I can't understand the silence on her part.' "'I can,' said Jennings promptly. "'In some way Basil is mixed up in the matter, "'and his accusing you means his acknowledging "'that he was near Rose Cottage on the night of the crime. "'He funks making so damaging an admission. "'Ah, I dare say,' said Cuthbert, "'particularly as he quarrelled with his aunt a week before the death. "'Did he quarrel with her? "'Of course. "'Didn't I tell you what he said today? "'He's in a fine rage with the dead woman. "'And you know what an uncontrollable temper he has. "'I've seen him rage at Maraquito's when he lost a baccarat. "'Silly ass. "'He can't play decently and lose his money like a gentleman. "'How Juliet ever came to have such a bounder for a brother, I can't imagine. "'She's the soul of honour, and Basil. "'Bah!' "'He quarrelled with his aunt,' murmured Jennings. "'And he has a violent temper, as we both knew.' Hmph, he may have something to do with the matter. Do you know where he was on the night? Yes, Juliet and he went to the Marlowe Theatre to see a melodrama by a new playwright. Ha, huh, said Jennings, half to himself, and the Marlowe Theatre is not far from Rexton. I'll make a note of that. Had they a box? I believe so. It was sent by the man who wrote the play. Who is he? I can't say. One of that lot who plays at being poets in Octagon House. A set of idiots. "'But what do you make of all this, Jennings?' "'I think with you that Mrs. Octagon and her cub of a son "'are trying to stop the marriage by bringing you into the matter of the crime. "'Were you down there on that night?' "'Yes,' said Cuthbert with hesitation, and to Jennings' surprise. "'I did not intend to say anything about it, as my uncle asked me to hold my tongue. "'But since things have come to this pass, you may as well know that I was there, "'and about the time of the murder, too.' "'Jennings sat up and stared.' "'Great heavens! Mallow, why didn't you tell me this the other night?' "'You might have arrested me there and then,' retorted Cuthbert. "'I promised my uncle to hold my tongue. But now—' "'You will tell me all. My dear fellow, make a clean breast of it. "'Rest easy. You shall learn everything. "'You know that the house at the back of Rose Cottage has been deserted for something like twenty years, more or less. "'Yes, you told me about it the other night. "'Caranby ran a fifteen-feet wall around it, and the inside is a regular jungle.' "'Well, the house is supposed to be haunted. "'Lights have been seen moving about, and strange noises have been heard. "'What kind of noises? "'Oh, moans and clanking chains and all that sort of thing. "'I heard indirectly about this through Juliet. "'Where did she hear the report? "'From Miss Loach's cook, a woman called Pill. "'The cook asserted that the house was haunted, "'and described the noises and the lights. "'I don't believe in spooks myself, and thought some tricks were being played. "'So one day I went down and had a look.' "'That day I was there?' asked Jennings, recalling Cuthbert's presence. "'Before that, a week or two. "'I saw nothing. "'The house is rotting, and nothing appeared to be disturbed. "'I examined the park and found no footmarks. "'In fact, there wasn't a sign of anyone about. "'You should have gone at night when the ghost was larking. "'That's what Caranby said. "'I told him when he came back to London. "'He was very annoyed. "'You know his romance about that house, an absurd thing it is. 
"'All the same, Caranby is tender on the point. "'I advised him to pull the house down "'and let the land out with building leases. "'He thought he would, "'but asked me to go at night and stir up the ghost. "'I went on the night of the murder "'and got into the grounds by climbing the wall. "'There's no gate, you know.' "'At what time?' "'Some time between ten and eleven. "'I'm not quite sure. "'Good heavens, man, that is the very hour the woman was killed. "'Yes, and for that reason I held my tongue, "'particularly as I got over the wall near the cottage. "'Where do you mean? "'Well, there's a field of corn, nearly ready to be cut, near the cottage. "'It's divided from the garden by a fence. "'I came along the footpath that leads from the station and jumped the fence. "'Did you enter Mrs. Loach's grounds? "'No, I had no right to. "'I saw a light in the basement, but I did not take much notice.' "'I was too anxious to find the ghost. "'Well, I ran along the fence, on the fields of corn side, remember, "'and got over the wall. "'Then I dodged through the park, scratching myself a lot. "'I could find nothing. "'The house seemed quiet enough, so after a quarter of an hour I had enough of it. "'I got out over the wall on the other side and came home. "'I caught a cold which necessitated my wearing a greatcoat the next day. "'So there you have my ghost hunting, and a fine fool I was to go. "'I wish you had told me this before, Mallow. "'If I had, you would have thought I'd killed the old woman. "'But now I tell you, as I want this matter sifted to the bottom, "'I refused to speak before, as I didn't wish to be dragged into the case. "'Did you see anything in the cottage? "'Not a thing. I saw no one. I heard no sound. "'Not even a scream? "'Not even a scream,' said Mallow. "'Had I heard anything, I should have gone to see what was the matter.' "'Strange,' murmured Jennings. "'Can't you tell the exact time?' "'Not to a minute. It was shortly after ten. I can't say how many minutes. Perhaps a quarter of an hour. But not suspecting anything was going to happen, I didn't look at my watch.' Jennings looked thoughtfully at the carpet. "'I wonder if the assassin escaped that way,' he murmured. "'Which way?' "'Over the wall and through the park. You see, he could not have gone up the lane, or through the railway path, without stumbling against that policeman. But he might have slipped out of the front door at half-past ten and climbed as you did over the wall to cross the park and drop over the other. In this way he would elude the police. Perhaps, said Cuthbert disbelievingly, but it was nearly eleven when I left the park. If anyone had been in my heels, I would have noticed. I am not so sure of that. The park, as you say, is a kind of jungle. The man might have seen you and taken his precautions. Moreover, added the detective, sitting up alertly, "'He might have written to Miss Saxon, saying he saw you on that night, and she—' "'Bosh!' interrupted Mallow roughly. "'He would give himself away. "'Not if the letter was anonymous.' "'Perhaps,' said the other again. "'But Basil may have been about the place and accused me. "'In that case he must explain his reason for being in the neighbourhood at that hour. "'But he won't, and you may be sure Miss Saxon, for his sake, will hold her tongue. "'No, Mallow, someone accuses you to Miss Saxon, Basil or another.' "'If we could only make her speak!' Cuthbert shook his head. "'I fear it's impossible.' "'Why not let me arrest you?' suggested Jennings. "'And then, if at any time, she would speak.' "'Hang it, no!' cried Mallow in dismay. "'That would be too realistic, Jennings. "'I don't want it known that I was hanging about the place on that night. "'My explanation might not be believed. "'In any case, people would throw mud at me, "'considering I am engaged to the niece of the dead woman.' "'Yes, I can see that. "'Well,' Jennings rose and stretched himself. I must see what Susan has to say. He glanced at his watch. She should be here in a few minutes. A silence ensued which was broken by Jennings. Oh, by the way, he said, taking some papers out of his pocket. I looked up the saw case. Well, what about it? asked Cuthbert indolently. Jennings referred to his notes. The Saul family, he said, seems to have been a bad lot. There was a mother, a brother, and a daughter. Amelia! "'Just so. They were all coiners. Somewhere in Hampstead they had a regular factory. Others were mixed up in the matter also, but Mrs. Saw was the head of the gang. Then Amelia grew tired of the life. I expect it told on her nerves. She went to the concert platform and met Caranby. Then she died, as you know. Afterwards the mother and brother were caught. They bolted. The mother, I believe, died. It was believed she was poisoned for having betrayed secrets.' The brother went to jail, and got out years afterwards on ticket of leave, and then died also. The rest of the gang were put in jail, but I can't say what became of them. Cuthbert shrugged his shoulders. This does not help us much. 
No, but it shows you what an escape your uncle had from marrying the woman. I can't understand. No more can Karen be, said Mallow, smiling. He loved Miss Loach, but Amelia exercised a kind of hypnotic influence over him. However, she is dead, and I can see no connection between her and this crime. Well, said Jennings soberly, it appears that some other person besides the mother gave a clue to the breaking up of the gang, and the whereabouts of the factory. Supposing that person was Selina Loach, who hated Amelia for having taken Caranby from her, one of the gang, released lately from the prison, may have killed the old lady out of revenge. What, after all these years? Revenge is a passion that grows with years, said Jennings grimly. At all events, I intend to go on ferreting out evidence about this old coining case, particularly as there are many false coins circulating now. I should not be surprised to learn that the factory has been set up again. Miss Loach may have known, and— This is all supposition, cried Mallow. I can't see the slightest connection between the coiners and this murder. Besides, it does not explain why Juliet hints at my being implicated. Jennings did not reply. "'There's the bell, too,' he murmured, his eyes on the ground. "'That might be explained.' He looked up briskly. "'I tell you what, Mallow, this case may turn out to be a bigger thing than either of us suspect.' "'It's quite big enough for me as it is,' retorted Cuthbert. "'Although I don't know what you mean. "'All I desire is to get to the root of the matter and marry Juliet. "'Find Miss Loach's assassin, Jennings, and don't bother with this dead-and-gone coining case.' "'There's a connection between the two, said Jennings, obstinately. "'It's impossible to say how the connection comes about, "'but I feel that a discovery in one case entails a discovery in the other. "'If I can prove that Miss Loach was killed by one of the old coiners, "'what will happen then? "'I may stumble on the factory that is in existence now.' "'He would have gone on to explain himself more fully, "'but that Mallow's man entered with the information "'that a young person was waiting and had asked for Mr. Jennings.' Mallow ordered the servant to admit her, and shortly Susan Grant, nervous and blushing, entered the room. "'I am glad to see you,' said Jennings, placing a chair for her. "'This is Mr. Mallow. We wish to ask you a few questions.' "'I have seen Mr. Mallow before,' said Susan, gasping and flushing. "'At Rose Cottage?' said Mallow inquiringly. "'No, when I was with Signora Gredos as a parlour-maid.' "'Signora Gredos?' said Jennings, before Cuthbert could speak. "'Do you mean Maraquito?' "'I have heard that her name was Maraquito, sir,' said Susan calmly. "'A lame lady and fond of cards. "'She lives in—' "'I know where she lives,' said Cuthbert, flushing in his turn. "'I went there occasionally to play cards. "'I never saw you.' "'But I saw you, sir,' said the girl fervently. "'Often I have watched you when you thought I wasn't, and—' "'One moment,' said Jennings, interrupting. "'Let's just get to the pith of the matter at once. "'Where did you get Mr. Mallow's portrait?' "'I don't want to say,' murmured the girl. "'But you must say,' said Mallow angrily. "'I order you to confess.' "'I kept silent for your sake, sir,' she said, her eyes filled with tears. "'But if you must know, I took the portrait from Signora Gredos's dressing-room when I left her house, and I left it on your account, sir,' she finished defiantly. End of chapter 9 Read by Shirley Anderson of the secret passage this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by roger moline the secret passage by fergus hume chapter 10 the parlor maid story on hearing the confession of the girl both men looked at one another in amazement how could Cuthbert's photograph have come into the possession of Signor Grados, and why had Susan Grant stolen it? And again, why did she hint that she had held her tongue about the matter for the sake of Mallow? Jennings at once proceeded to get at the truth. While being examined, Susan wept with an occasional glance at the bewildered Cuthbert. You were with Marquito as parlor maid? With Signor Grados? "'Yes, sir, for six months.' "'Do you know what went on in that house?' Susan ceased her sobs and stared. "'I don't know what you mean,' she said, looking puzzled. 
It was a gay house, I know, but there was nothing wrong that I ever saw, save that I don't hold with cards being played on Sunday. And on every other night of the week, muttered Jennings. Did you ever hear Senora Gredos called Maraquito? Sometimes the gentleman who came to play cards called her by that name, but she told her maid, who was my friend, that they were old friends of hers, and I think they were sorry for poor Senora Gredos, sir, added Miss Grant, naively, as she suffered so much with her back. You know, she rarely moved from her couch. It was always wheeled into the room where the gambling took place. "'Ah, you knew that gambling went on,' said Jennings, snapping her up sharply. "'Don't you know that is against the law?' "'No, sir. Do you know?' Cuthbert could not restrain a laugh. "'That's one for you, Jennings,' said he, nodding. "'You often went to the Soho house.' "'I had my reasons for saying nothing,' replied the detective hastily. "'You may be sure I could have ended the matter at once had I spoken to my chief about it. As it was, I judged it best to let matters remain as they were, so long as the house was respectably conducted. "'I'm sure it was conducted well, sir,' said Susan, who appeared rather indignant. "'Senora Gredos was a most respectable lady. She lived alone always, I believe?' "'Yes, sir.' Then Susan hesitated. "'I wonder if she had a mother.' "'Why do you wonder?' "'Well, sir, the lady who came to see Miss Loach—' "'Mrs. Hearn?' "'I heard her name was Mrs. Hearn, but she was as like Senora Gredos as two peas, save that she was older and had gray hair.' Hm," said Jennings, pondering. "'Did you ever hear Senora Gredos speak of Mrs. Hearn?' "'Never, sir. But Mrs. Pill, the cook of Miss Loach, said that Mrs. Hearn lived at Hampstead. But she was like my old mistress.' When I opened the door to her, I thought she was Senor Grados. But then the scent may have made me think that. Jennings looked up sharply. The scent? What do you mean? Senora Grados, explained Susan quietly, used a very nice scent, a Japanese scent called Hikui. She used no other, and I never met any lady who did, save Mrs. Hearn. Oh, so Mrs. Hearn used it. She did, sir. When I opened the door on that night, Susan shuddered, the first thing I knew was the smell of Hikui making the passage like a hairdresser's shop. I leaned forward to see if the lady was Senora Grados, and she turned her face away. But I caught sight of it, and if she isn't some relative of my last mistress, may I never eat bread again. Did Mrs. Hearn seem offended when you examined her face? She gave a kind of start at the sight of you, said Jennings quickly. La, no, sir, she never saw me before. I'm not so sure of that, muttered the detective. Did you also recognize Mr. Clancy and Mr. Hale as having visited the Soho house? No, sir, I never set eyes on them before. But as parlor maid, you must have opened the door to... Just a moment, sir, said Susan quickly. I opened the door in the day when few people came. After eight, the page, Gibbert, took my place, and I hardly ever went upstairs, as Senora Grados told me to keep below. One evening I did come up and saw— Here her eyes rested on Cuthbert, with a look which made him turn crimson. I wish I had never come up on that night. See here, my girl, said Mallow irritably. Do you mean to say— "'Hold on, Mallow,' interposed Jennings. "'Let me ask a question.' He turned to Susan, now weeping again with downcast eyes. "'Mr. Mallow's face made an impression on you?' "'Yes, sir. But then I knew every line of it before.' "'How was that?' Susan looked up surprised. "'The photograph in Senora Grado's dressing-room. I often looked at it, and when I left I could not bear to leave it behind.' It was stealing, I know, cried Miss Grant tearfully, and I have been brought up respectably, but I couldn't help myself. By this time Cuthbert was the color of an autumn sunset. He was a modest young man, and these barefaced confessions made him wince. He was about to interpose irritably when Jennings turned on him with a leading question. Why did you give that photograph to— 
"'Confound it!' cried Mallow, jumping up. "'I did no such thing. "'I knew Maraquito only as the keeper of the gambling house. "'There was nothing between—' "'Don't, sir,' said Susan, rising in her turn with a flush of jealousy. "'I saw her kissing the photograph.' "'Then she must be crazy,' cried Mallow. "'I never gave her any occasion to behave so foolishly. "'For months I have been engaged, and—' he here became aware that he was acting foolishly in talking like this to a lovesick servant, and turned on his heel abruptly. "'I'll go in the next room,' said he. "'Call me when you wish for my presence, Jennings. I can't possibly stay and listen to this rubbish.' And going out, he banged the door, thereby bringing a fresh burst of tears from Susan Grant. Every word he said pierced her heart. "'Now I've made him cross,' she wailed, "'and I would lay down my life for him. "'That I would.' "'See here, my girl,' said Jennings, "'soothingly and fully prepared to make use "'of the girl's infatuation. "'It is absurd your being in love "'with a gentleman of Mr. Mallow's position.' "'Miss Grant tossed her head. "'I've read Bowbells and the Family Herald, sir,' "'she said positively.' and many a time have I read of a governess, which is no more than a servant, marrying an earl. And that Mr. Mallow isn't, sir. He will be when Lord Caranby dies, said Jennings, hardly knowing what to say, and fiction isn't truth. Besides, Mr. Mallow is engaged. I know, sir, to Miss Saxon. Well, poor Susan sighed, she is a sweet young lady. I suppose he loves her. "'Devotedly. He will be married soon.' "'And she's got Miss Loach's money, too,' sighed Susan again. "'What a lucky young lady. Handsome looks in a husband, and gold galore. A poor servant like me has to look on and keep her heart up with the church service. But I tell you what, sir,' she added, drying her eyes and apparently becoming resigned, "'if I ain't a lady, Senor Grados is.' and she won't let Mr. Mallow marry Miss Saxon. But Mr. Mallow is not in love with Senora Grados. Perhaps not, sir, but she's in love with him. Yes, you may look and look, Mr. Jennings, but lame as she is, and weak in the back and unable to move from that couch, she loves him. She had that photograph in her room and kissed it, as it I saw with my own eyes. I took it the last thing before I went, as I loved Mr. Mallow, too, and I was not going to let that Spanish lady kiss him even in a picture. Upon my word, murmured Jennings, taken aback by this vehemence. It is very strange, all this. Oh, yes, you gentlemen don't think a poor girl has a heart. I couldn't help falling in love, though he never looked my way. But that Miss Saxon is a sweet, kind young lady put upon by her mother. I wouldn't give him up even to her. But I can see there's no chance for me, wept Susan, seeing the way he has gone out, banging the door in a temper, so I'll give him up, and I'll go now. My heart's broken. But Jennings made her sit down again. Not yet, my girl, he said firmly. If you wish to do Mr. Mallow a good turn— Oh, I'll do that, she interrupted with sparkling eyes. After all, he can't help giving his heart elsewhere. It's just my foolishness to think otherwise. But how can I help him, sir? He wants to find out who killed Miss Loach. I can't help him there, sir. I don't know who killed her. Mrs. Hearn and Mr. Clancy and Mr. Hale were all gone, and when the bell rang she was alone, dead in her chair with them cards on her lap. Oh, Susan's voice became shrill and hysterical. What a horrible sight! Yes, yes, said Jennings soothingly. We'll come to that shortly, my girl. But about this photograph, was it in Senora Grado's dressing room long? For about three months, sir. I saw it one morning when I took up her breakfast and fell in love with the handsome face. Then Gibber told me the gentleman came to the house sometimes, and I went up the stairs against orders after eight to watch. I saw him and found him more good-looking than the photograph. 
Often did I watch him and envy Senora Gratos, the picture with them loving words. Sir, said Susan, sitting up stiffly, if Mr. Mallow is engaged to Miss Saxon and doesn't love Senora Gratos, why did he write those words? He did not write them for her, said Jennings doubtfully. At least, I don't think so. It is impossible to say how the photograph came into the possession of that lady. Will you ask him, sir? Yes, when you are gone. But he won't speak while you are in the room. Susan drooped her head and rose dolefully. My dream is gone, she said mournfully. Though I was improving myself in spelling and figures so that I might go out as a governess and perhaps meet him in high circles. Ah, uh, that's all family herald fiction, said Jennings, not unkindly. Yes, I know now, sir. My delusions are gone, but I will do anything I can to help Mr. Mallow, and I hope he'll always think kindly of me. I'm sure he will. By the way, what are you doing now? I go home to help mother at Stepney, sir, me having no call to go out to service. I have a happy home, though not fashionable, and after my heart being crushed I can't go out again, sighed Susan sadly. Are you sorry to leave Rose Cottage? No, sir, Susan shuddered. That dead body with the blood and the cards will haunt me always. Mrs. Pill, as is going to marry Thomas Barnes and rent the cottage, wanted me to stay, but I couldn't. Jennings pricked up his ears. What's that? How can Mrs. Pill rent so expensive a place? It's by arrangement with Miss Saxon, sir. Mrs. Pill told me all about it. Miss Saxon wished to sell the place, but Thomas Barnes spoke to her and said he had saved money while in Miss Loach's service for twenty years. Ah, said Jennings, thoughtfully. He was that time in Miss Loach's service, was he? Yes, sir, and got good wages. Well, sir, Miss Saxon, hearing he wished to marry the cook and take the cottage and keep boarders, let him rent it with furniture as it stands. She and Mrs. Octagon are going back to town, and Mrs. Pill is going to have the cottage cleaned from cellar to attic before she marries Thomas and receives the boarder. Oh, so she has a boarder? Yes, sir. She wouldn't agree to Thomas taking the cottage as her husband unless she had a boarder to start with, being afraid she and Thomas could not pay the rent. So Thomas saw Mr. Clancy, and he is coming to stop. He has taken all the part where Miss Loach lived and doesn't want anyone else in the house, being a quiet man and retired. Ah! 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 said Jennings in three different tones of voice. I think Mrs. Pill is very wise. I hope she and Thomas will do well. By the way, what do you think of Mr. Barnes? Susan did not leave him long in doubt as to her opinion. I think he is a stupid fool, she said, and it's a good thing Mrs. Pill is going to marry him. He was guided by Miss Loach all his life, and now she's dead. He goes about like a gaby. One of those men, sir, explained Susan, as needs a woman to look after them. Not like that gentleman, she cast a tender glance at the door, who can protect the weakest of my sex. Jennings, having learned all he could, rose. Well, Miss Grant, he said quietly, I am obliged to you for your frank speaking. My advice to you is to go home and think no more of Mr. Mallow. You might as well love the moon. But you know my address, and should you hear of anything likely to lead you to suspect who killed Miss Loach, Mr. Mallow will make it worth your while to come to me with the information. I'll do all I can, said Susan resolutely. But I won't take a penny piece, me having my feelings as other and higher ladies. Just as you please. But Mr. Mallow is about to offer a reward on behalf of his uncle, Lord Caranby. He that was in love with Miss Loach, sir? Yes. On account of that old love, Lord Caranby desires to learn who killed her. And Mr. Mallow also wishes to know, for a private reason. I expect you will be calling to see Mrs. Pill? When she's Mrs. Barnes, I think so, sir. 
I go to the wedding, and me and Geraldine are going to be bridesmaids. Then if you hear or see anything likely to lead to a revelation of the truth, you will remember. By the way, you don't know how Senora Gratos got that photograph? No, sir, I do not. And you think Mrs. Hearn is Senora Gratos's mother? Yes, sir, I do. Thank you. That will do for the present. Keep your eyes open and your mouth closed, and when you hear of anything likely to interest me, call at the address I gave you. Yes, sir, said Susan, and took her leave, not without another lingering glance at the door behind which Mallow waited impatiently. When she was gone, Jennings went into the next room to find Cuthbert smoking. He jumped up when he saw the detective. "'Well, has that silly girl gone?' he asked angrily. "'Yes, poor soul. You needn't get in a wax, Mallow. The girl can't help falling in love with you. Poor people have feelings as well as rich.' "'I know that, but it's ridiculous, especially as I never saw the girl before, and then I love only Juliet.' "'You are sure of that?' "'Jennings!' "'There, there, don't get angry. "'We must get to the bottom of this affair "'which is getting more complicated every day. "'Did you give that photograph to Senora Grados? "'To Maraquito? "'No, I didn't. "'I gave it to Juliet. "'You are certain?' "'Positive. "'I can't make out how it came into Maraquito's house.' "'Jennings pondered. "'Perhaps Basil may have given it to her.' It is to his interest on behalf of his mother to make trouble between you and Miss Saxon. Moreover, if it is as I surmise, it shows that Mrs. Octagon intended to stop the marriage, if she could, even before her sister died. Ah, and it shows that the death of Miss Loach gave her a chance of asserting herself and stopping the marriage. Well, she might have hesitated to do that before, as Miss Loach might not have left her fortune to Juliet if the marriage did not take place. Cuthbert nodded and spoke musingly. After all, the old woman liked me, and I was the nephew of the man who loved her in her youth. Her heart may have been set on the match, and she might have threatened to leave her fortune elsewhere if Mrs. Octagon did not agree. Failing this, Mrs. Octagon, through Basil, gave that photograph to Maraquito in the hope that Juliet would ask questions of me. And if she had asked questions, asked Jennings quickly. Cuthbert looked uncomfortable. Don't think me a conceited ass, he said, trying to laugh. But Maraquito is in love with me. I stayed away from her house because she became too attentive. I never told you this, as no man has a right to reveal a woman's weakness. But, as matters are so serious, it is right you should know. I am glad I do now. By the way, Cuthbert, what between Miss Saxon, Susan Grant, and Maraquito, you will have a hard time. How absurd, said Mallow angrily. Juliet is the only woman I love, and Juliet I intend to marry. Maraquito will prevent your marriage. If she can, scoffed Cuthbert. Jennings looked grave. I am not so sure but what she can make mischief. There's Mrs. Hearn, who may or may not be the mother of this Spanish demon. Perhaps a demon herself, ventured Mallow. No, said the detective positively. Maraquito can't move from her couch. You know that. However, I shall call on Mrs. Hearn at Hampstead. She was a witness, you know. Keep quiet, Mallow, and let me make inquiries. Meantime, ask Miss Saxon when she missed that photograph. Can you see your way now? I have a slight clue, but it will be a long time before I learn the truth. There is a lot at the back of that murder, Mallow. End of chapter 10 Recording by Roger Moline